We're reading from Matthew chapter 11 this morning. Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. <clears throat> this is probably a very familiar portion of Scripture to some of us. And one of the issues that we sometimes have to watch out for in connection with such passages or verses as this is that we can tend to see them in just one way or, or solely in reference to the way that we've heard it preached on in the past. Or maybe we only see a particular truth that God showed us and that helped us at some previous time in our lives. And so I'm praying, as I prayed for myself, as I began to look at this scripture again, that we might be able to see it with fresh eyes today. Now, as I studied at this time, four main words jumped out at me. Three of them referring to what we need to do, and the fourth referring to what the Lord promises to do. Those words are come, take, learn, and rest. If you have your Bibles there in front of you, you can see those there. Come, take, learn, and rest. And that's basically the outline of the message that I believe the Lord has for us this morning. Jesus begins by saying, come. It's an invitation. You notice it's an invitation to all but specifically to all those who are burdened and heavy laden, those who are loaded down under some kind of heavy weight. And we sometimes apply this to any situation in which we find ourselves laboring under something that is weighing us down or burdening us. You know, something that is causing us to labor and is making us weary. It may be a load of grief over some loss that we've experienced in our lives. It might be a load of concern about family problems or relationship issues. Or a load of worry about some changes that are taking place in our lives. Or a load related to health issues for ourselves or maybe for our loved ones. A load or a burden that we might carry about the spiritual condition of people around us or just the spiritual condition of our nation and our world today. It could be anything like that weighing heavy on us. And I believe we can apply these truths to those situations. And many of us have done that and have found it helpful to us over the years. But it's also helpful to, to recognize the context in which Jesus spoke these words and what specifically he may have had in mind for those at that time who were there listening to him. The people Jesus spoke to were being loaded down with a bunch of religious rules that the Pharisees and other religious leaders focused on. They were being told that the way to God was to try to keep all these multitudinous regulations in their law. You know, not just the Ten Commandments, but a long list of other rules, many of which over the years men had added to what God had originally said. And it included all kinds of little nitpicky things. When the people were being told that salvation came by doing, by keeping all of these laws, even the, the littlest ones. Now over in Matthew chapter 23, when Jesus is condemning the scribes and the Pharisees, he says, They bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders. And that's exactly the same picture he describes here, isn't it? says they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders. It's just like what he's picturing here, people loaded down with heavy burdens. 
And so further evidence that this may have been what Jesus mainly had in mind here is what immediately follows these words. Now don't pay attention to the chapter break. This comes right at the end of chapter 11. But remember that, that those chapter breaks were added by translators later. In the original writings, it would have gone right into what is found here in, in what's the first part of chapter 12 in our Bibles. And what's there is that it deals with some of the picky regulations or man-made interpretations of the law, specifically regarding the keeping of the Sabbath. And that's an area where those religious leaders had especially added all kinds of rules about what a person could or couldn't do on the Sabbath, the day of rest. You know, they had it like pinpointed down to the exact distance you could walk or travel and exactly what you could do without that being considered work. I mean, it, some of it was, was just ridiculous. And here, in, in the, as we get into chapter 12 here, here is the incident where Jesus and his disciples are walking through a field, and the disciples just pick a few pieces to munch on because they're hungry, and the Pharisees condemn them because it went against their rules. That was considered harvesting a crop. And you couldn't do that on the Sabbath. And then right after that, Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath. And they didn't like that either. And this is the occasion when Jesus tells them it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. But those were the kind of burdens that the religious community had placed on people that the people were trying to live under. And Jesus says, come to me. You know, maybe saying, it's not about doing. It's not about trying to keep all those rules. It's, not, it's about a relationship with me. Come to me, and then you'll find God and salvation and what you really need. And we still need to realize that today. What we primarily need is found in Jesus and a relationship with him. If we're weighed down under the heavy burden of trying to be good enough to be acceptable to God, now we need to cast off that weight because we'll never be able to lift it. And we need to come to Jesus. If we're laboring under the notion that it's through our coming to church, or church attendance, or the giving of an offering, or a tithe, or helping people in need, or, or how often we read our Bibles, and, and praying every day, or, or anything else that will cause us to be okay with God and get to heaven, we're laboring for something we cannot achieve. Now, we may do some of those things as a result of our relationship with the Lord, and we should, but doing those things aren't what saves us. The only way to God is through trusting Jesus. We've got to look to him and what he did for us on the cross as our way to be forgiven and to be made right with a holy God. We've got to come to Jesus. And yes, we can come to him with whatever other burdens we may be laboring under too. He can help us with those as well. But first, we've got to put our trust in him as the only one who can save us from our sins and give us eternal life. Then we can trust him with these, all those other burdens that we may be carrying today. Whatever our need, Jesus invites us to come to him to seek the help that we need. Then Jesus says, take. Take my yoke upon you. Now, we all probably know pretty much what a yoke is. It's a device that was used by farmers, a, a wooden cross piece that was fastened over the necks of two animals and then attached, attached to a plow or cart or whatever it is that those animals would be pulling. Uh, we probably most often associate it with oxen pulling a plow. The yoke would enable those oxen to be controlled and to work in tandem to pull their load. So to take a yoke upon us would mean, for one thing, that we are putting ourselves under the control of another. We are submitting ourselves to someone. So in reference to, to us and Jesus, 
this takes it a step further or I guess we'd say it goes a little deeper than simply coming to Jesus. This indicates surrendering to him and refers to obedience to him, that we're going to follow wherever he leads. We're willingly putting ourselves under his full control to do whatever he says. Now, when we first come to Jesus, you know, we often come primarily looking for forgiveness looking for a way to get reconciled to God and to no longer be under condemnation. We're looking for a way to escape the prospect of hell and, and instead get on the road leading to a heavenly home. And, and as, as we do that, we discover a loving Savior who died on the cross in our place and took our punishment so that we could be saved and become children of God and have a right relationship with Him. And that's a wonderful thing. But it doesn't stop there. Jesus doesn't just call us to come to him and receive salvation, but to follow him and surrender our lives to him, to let him guide us and for us to obey his will for us. He calls us to become disciples. Now, some some people think that this idea of taking the yoke may have actually been a common expression used back then when a person did become a disciple or a student of someone else, that they took that person's yoke upon them. They were committing themselves to being under the leadership of that person. We need to not only come to Jesus for salvation, but also submit ourselves to his leadership in our lives. We need to let him truly be Lord over our lives, calling the shots, so to speak, directing us. Taking the yoke is like getting to that place of surrender and saying, not my will, but yours be done. You know, I'm no longer in the driver's seat of my life. I'm going to let you, Lord, take charge. Uh, That reminds me of our our 17-year-old, our 16-year-old grandson, Jason, He got his driver's license the other day. So now he can sit in the driver's seat all by himself without anybody else in the car. So you've been warned. Watch out for Jason out there. But this that we're talking about here is kind of going the opposite direction. That we've been the one sitting in the driver's seat of our lives, but now we're surrendering that seat of control and authority and guidance to the Lord. We're taking his yoke upon us and letting him drive. And notice, it's still a yoke. There's still a load to pull. You know, surrendering our lives to Jesus doesn't mean that there won't be any burdens to bear. Uh, In a way, there may be more burdens to bear at times. As Satan attacks us, and as we carry burdens that go along with, with the love and concern that we have for others and for the world around us, And we will still have tough days. Kind of like this past Thursday seemed like one of those days for Cheryl and me when when everything was hard. Uh, She hit a pothole or something just before she got to work and ended up with two flat tires. And I had to go to Athens to try to help her with that. And then later in in the day, I had to get a crown put back on a a tooth, a crown that, that had fallen off earlier in the week. And then for dinner that evening, we had to wait 30 minutes or so for some fast food. And and it was just one of those days, especially for Cheryl. She had several other things that went on that day. You know, we'll still have those. But notice what Jesus says here. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Compared to being a slave to sin, Jesus' yoke is easy. And compared to carrying the weight of sin and guilt, Any burden that we carry as a follower of Jesus is light. And part of the reason for that is because Jesus is right there with us, helping us carry it. In a sense, he not only puts the yoke on us, but he puts himself in the other side of that yoke. We're in tandem with him now. He's helping us bear that load, whatever it is. And without a doubt, No, he's carrying most of the weight. It's kind of like when I let one of my grandkids, one of my young grandkids, help me carry something heavy. They may have their hands on it so that they can help Papa, 
but I'm actually carrying most of the weight. Now, if it's my older grandchildren, sometimes it's the other way around. Uh, They may be carrying most of the weight uh, instead of me. But that's what Jesus does for us. Surrender yourself completely to Jesus. Let him be in control, and you'll find it a joy and a blessing, and you'll find that Jesus is right there with you, bearing most of the load of whatever it is that you have to face. Then Jesus says, learn from me. Warren Worsby rightly observes that these other two commands represent a crisis, something we can do in a moment of time, you know, coming to Jesus and surrendering to him. But this one, this one is more of a process. We should be continually learning more about Jesus as we walk with him each day, as we study his word, as we pray and fellowship with him, as we see how he's working in our lives. We continue to get a better understanding of Jesus and who he is and what he is like. As we've been saying, you know, that's part of our purpose in this series of messages in Matthew. It's to help us learn more about Jesus, to help us get a better and truer picture of what Jesus was actually like and what he said and taught so that we can recognize those false ideas about him that are being proclaimed these days. We need to keep learning from Jesus and learning about Jesus. Not only so that we know what Jesus was like, but so that we can get a better picture of what we should be like, because we are to becoming more like him. So here Jesus specifically says that he is gentle and lowly in heart. That's part of his character, and therefore it should be more of our character too. Now that's not all Jesus was. It's interesting that's what he emphasized here. But, you know, he was tough when he needed to be. You know, when the occasion called for it, he turned over the tables of the corrupt money changers in the temple and physically forced them out of that place. But Jesus wasn't some kind of Tasmanian devil, and I'm thinking of the old cartoon character you may remember there. He wasn't some guy plowing through Jerusalem and Galilee or wherever he went like a tornado and you'd better not get in his way. No. No. Now, he was kind and gentle and patient with people. He was the one who took time to take children in his arms and bless them. He went around doing good and helping people, not just creating chaos and destruction. And that's how we need to be, too. And in our day, I know, you know we may need to be fighters at times, but we still need to be gentle and lowly and show the kind of loving and caring spirit that Jesus showed. Let's keep learning of Jesus and from Jesus about who he is and what we need to be and what his will is for us. Then the other key word in this passage is rest. Rest. And maybe, you know, we we talked about the Sabbath regulations. Well, of course, the Sabbath was a day of rest. Maybe that's something Jesus had in mind as he talked about this rest here. Jesus said, come to me, and I will give you rest. And then he defines more what he is talking about here. As much as we might like to think of this in terms of physical rest, that we come to Jesus when we're tired and weary and he'll give us rest physically, that's not the main thing Jesus had in mind. It may be included at times, but it's not the main thing. Jesus defines it here for us at the end of verse 29. He says, you will find rest for your souls. For your souls. Jesus, Jesus is talking more about the spiritual and emotional rest that we may need, that peace in our hearts and minds. When we come to Him in faith, trusting Him for salvation, we'll find rest from that heavy burden of trying to earn God's favor. When we surrender ourselves to Him and take His yoke on us and let Him in the driver's seat, we find the rest and the peace that comes from letting go and letting him have his way. Part of that rest is knowing that we are at peace with God, that our sins are forgiven, and we're on good terms with God now. And part of it is the peace of God that now rests on us, that no matter what we have to face in life, no matter what burdens we bear or challenges that come, we can experience the peace of God in the midst of the storms. We can rest in him. Jesus wants to give us rest from worry. 
He wants to give us rest from our running around, trying to do it all in our own strength. He wants to give us rest from shouldering those loads ourselves. He wants to bless us with the peace and assurance that comes from trusting Him and knowing that He's got this, whatever it is, and He will be with us. It's the peace and rest that comes from knowing Jesus is right there in the other side of that yoke. And even if we stumble and falter, he'll keep the load up and he'll help us back up too. If your soul isn't at rest today, then this message may be for you. Don't just pray for peace or rest, but do what Jesus says we need to do. And he promises to give us that rest that we need. Come to him. Submit to him. Take his yoke. And learn from him and keep learning from him. And he will give you rest for your soul. Come, you who are laboring and heavy laden. Jesus wants to give you rest.